everyone in the room, which is great to see, lovely to see your faces today. Um, with this privilege, I'm grateful to introduce myself, uh, Jonathan, uh, my model, good afternoon. I'm a director here at uh, DW Fox Tucker Lawyers, specialising in employment law. Um, our team is dedicated to uh, advising employees on nav navigating the complexities of employment and uh, workplace safety laws, uh, as well as defending against employment related claims. Today, um, Helene, my colleague, and I shall be discussing the topic of uh, growing importance in corporate wealth at being director's duties and the increasing risks of uh, liability. In recent years, the landscape of corporate governance has undergone significant changes with a marked shift towards holding directors personally accountable for their actions or their inactions in managing their companies. This shift, which involves piercing the corporate veil, means that the traditional separation between company and its directors is no longer as robust as it once was. Today, directors face increased scrutiny and the consequences of meeting their duties can be severe. To understand the current environment, it's essential to look back at how directors' duties have evolved. Historically, directors were seen as stewards of the company, with their primary duty being to act in the best interests of the company and shareholders. This fiduciary duty was the cornerstone of corporate governance, with directors expected to act with care, diligence, and loyalty. However, as corporate scandals, financial crises, and workplace incidents have shown, the consequences of directors failing their duties can be catastrophic, not just for the company, but for employees, the investors, and the broader community. As a result, both legislators and the courts have been increasingly focused on holding directors accountable, not just to shareholders, but to a broader range of stakeholders, including employees, creditors, and public. This shift is reflected in the introduction of more stringent rules and regulations governing directors' duties, particularly in areas like workplace safety and employee entitlements. The rationale behind these changes is clear. When directors fail to ensure compliance with these obligations, the consequences can be dire, including workplace accidents, financial losses, and damage to a company's reputation. Therefore, the law has evolved to place greater burden on directors to take proactive steps to manage these risks. Let's start by discussing workplace obligations, specifically directors' duties um, concerning workplace safety and employee entitlements. Now, these are two areas that are critical because they directly impact on the well-being of employees and the sustainability of business. So, in relation to workplace safety, the importance of workplace safety cannot be overstated in Australia. Workplace safety laws had their origins in the early 20th century, with state governments enacting legislation to protect workers from the dangers associated with industrialisation. Over time, these laws have evolved to reflect the changing nature of work and the increasing complexity of modern workplaces. In South Australia, for example, Occupational Health and Safety and Welfare Act was the key piece of legislation that placed the onus on employers to ensure a safe work environment. However, as businesses became more complex and the nature of work changed, it became clear that this framework needed to be updated to address new challenges. The introduction of the Work Health and Safety Act in 2011 marked a significant shift in how workplace safety is regulated. This legislation which was part of a broader national effort to harmonise safety laws across Australia, introduced the concept of a person conducting a business or undertaking, PCBU, which is a term that you've probably heard before. This term encompasses a wide range of business entities, including companies, partnerships, and even sole traders. The primary duty of a PCBU is to ensure, so far as reasonably practical, the health and safety of workers, 
including employees, contractors, volunteers, and trainees. For directors, this means that their responsibilities have expanded significantly. No longer can they simply delegate safety matters to lower level managers or safety officers. Instead, directors must take an active role in ensuring that their business complies with safety rules. This includes being informed about hazards and risks associated with the business's operations, ensuring that adequate resources are allocated to manage these risks and regularly monitoring the company's safety performance. A failure to meet these obligations can result in serious consequences, including in criminal prosecution, fines, and in some cases, imprisonment. The Work Health Safety Act imposes a positive duty on directors to exercise due diligence in ensuring compliance with safety laws. This means that directors cannot simply rely on the fact that they were unaware of a safety issue. Ignorance is not events, directors must be proactive in understanding and managing the safety risks. So let's consider the example of the Dream World tragedy in Queensland, where tragically four people lost their lives on a theme park called the Thunder River Rapids Ride. The incident led to widespread criticism of the company's safety practices and resulted in significant legal action. The directors of the company were scrutinised for their role in ensuring the park safety systems were adequate. The group were travelling in a raft on the Dream World ride when it collided with an unoccupied stranded raft and got pulled vertically into a conveyor. The incident was one which led to the introduction of the industrial manslaughter laws in Australia, which is a matter that I shall touch on in a few moments. The move came after a coronial inquest into the fatalities and it found that the theme park had relied on frighteningly unsophisticated safety systems for decades and failed to learn from previous incidents. The ride's numerous obvious hazards included a large pinch point at the end of the conveyor system, which would have easily been identifiable to a competent person had one been commissioned to conduct a risk and safety and hazard assessment of the ride. It was then concluded beyond doubt in the 30 years prior to this tragedy that Dreamwell failed to undertake either internally or via an external auditor, a holistic examination of the ride by a suitably qualified engineer so as to ensure a safe operation through the identification of high and low probability risks and the hazards present. This is one case that highlights the importance of directors being actively involved in managing safety risks and the severe consequences that can arise from failing to do so. Another critical area um, relates to employee entitlements, where directors must exercise vigilance the Fair Work Act, which governs most employment relationships in Australia, sets out minimum standards of employment, as you know, including wages, leave entitlements, and notice periods. These standards are designed to protect employees and ensure that they receive fair treatment in the workplace. Directors have a duty to ensure that their companies comply with these standards. This includes making sure that employees are paid their correct wages, that they receive their entitlement leave, and that they're entitled to the appropriate notice when the employment relationship has been terminated. The Fair Act Act includes provisions that allow for directors to be held personally responsible for breaches of employee entitlements, and this is particularly relevant in cases where directors are found to have been involved in the contribution. Now, this term involved in is broadly defined and can encompass a range of actions, including aiding, abetting, counselling, or procuring a breach. Now, I'll touch on that again in a few moments. But the practical advice is this to mitigate the risk of liability, directors should ensure that their companies have robust systems in place to manage employee entitlements. This includes regular audits of payroll systems, ensuring that employment contracts are up to date and compliant with latest legal requirements, 
and providing training to managers and HR staff on their obligations under the Fair Act. Directors should also seek legal advice where they're unsure about any aspect of their company's obligations. Turning now back to the Work and Health Safety Act and the introduction of the PCBU concept, which has fundamentally changed the way workplace safety is regulated. PCBUs have a broad duty to uh, duty of care to ensure the health and safety of workers. And this duty extends to directors, directors and officers of the PCBU. For directors, the implications are significant. They must exercise due diligence in ensuring the PCBU <coughs> complies with its obligations under the Work Health Safety Act. And this means that directors must Stay informed about the latest developments in workplace safety, including changes to legislation, emerging risks, and best practices in safety management. This knowledge is essential for directors to make informed decisions about safety matters and to fulfil their due diligence obligations. Two, directors must have a deep understanding of the business's operations and the specific hazards and risks that the operations entail. This understanding is crucial for under identifying potential safety issues and implementing effective controls to manage these risks. So it's at this point that I ask you to consider how many of you are regularly briefed on safety risks associated with your company's operations. How many of you have visited and worked at the site or observed operations firsthand to gain a better understanding of these risks? Understanding the day to day realities of your business is essential for effective risk management. Directors must ensure that the business allocates sufficient resources, such as personnel, equipment, and budget, to manage safety risks effectively. And this might include investing in new safety equipment, hiring safety officers, or providing training for employees on safe work practices. And lastly, Directors must ensure that there are robust systems in place to monitor and report on the business's compliance with safety rules. This might involve regular safety audits, incident reporting, and reviews of safety performance data. Directors should ensure that they receive regular updates on safety matters and that they are actively involved in reviewing and addressing any issues that arise. I said I'd touch on it a few moments ago, which brings me to industrial manslaughter. So the landscape of workplace safety laws has shifted significantly in the, with the introduction of industrial manslaughter laws in South Australia, effective as of 1 July 2024. These new laws make industrial manslaughter a criminal offence, which has far-reaching implications for directors and officers of companies. The key takeaway from these laws is that individuals can face a maximum penalty of up to 20 years in prison, and companies can be fined up to $18 million if they're found to have been reckless or grossly negligent in conduct that breaches workplace health and safety duties, resulting in the death of an individual. The intention behind these penalties is clear, it sends a strong message to those who place the lives of workers at risk that they will be held accountable. This introduction of legislation is in line with a broader national trend. South Australia now joins jurisdictions such as Queensland, Victoria, WA, and the ACT in making industrial manslaughter a crime. Even New South Wales introduced a bill to create this offence, re reflecting a unified national response to the tragic consequences of workplace safety breaches. The new industrial manslaughter provisions have been inserted into the Work Health Safety Act, and this law applies when a person or company breaches their duty, and that breach contributes substantially to the death of an individual. To convict someone of industrial manslaughter, four key elements must be proven. The person has the duty, they engage in conduct which breaches the duty. That conduct causes the death of an individual, and the person engaged in the conduct with gross negligence or recklessness is disregarding the risk of death or serious injury. So the framework makes it clear 
that only serious breaches of safety duties involving those in recklessness or gross negligence will be prosecuted under these extraordinary sort of provisions. But importantly, these laws apply to persons conducting a business or undertaking the PCBU. As such, employers, companies, and other business structures um, come within the ambit of the PCBU. Um, and it's defined broadly and includes employers, sole traders, self employed individuals, <coughs> companies, associations, and even certain volunteer organisations. Officers of a PCBU are those who make up um, or help make key decisions affecting the business, and they have a duty to exercise due diligence to ensure compliance with work health safety rules. These individuals are also liable under the new industrial manslaughter provisions if their failure to meet this duty results tell. It's becoming increasingly common for plaintiffs and their legal representatives to pursue claims personally against managers and others they believe were involved in breaches of the Fair Work Act. The Fair Work Act imposes personal liability on managers and other individuals, which often refer, is referred to as accessorial liability. Section 44 of the Fair Work Act requires an employer must not contravene a provision of the national employment standards. So the Fair Work Act contains numerous civil remedy, remedy provisions, which if breached, can expose the employer to significant penalties. These provisions include compliance with the national employment standards, which is referred to ordinarily as the NES, modern awards and enterprise agreements, general protections against adverse actions and sham contracting prohibitions. Section 550 of the Fair Work Act is particularly important as it provides that any person who is involved in prevention of a single civil remedy provision is considered to have breached that provision themselves. Accessorial liability occurs when a person or company is involved in the con contravention, and when this happens, they're treated in the same way as the employer responsible for the contravention. They can be ordered by a criminal to pay employees paid wages and entitlements, as well as penalties for their involvement in the contravention. There are significant penalties for general contraventions of fair work laws, and there are even more significant penalties for serious contraventions of fair work laws. What constitutes a serious contravention under the Fair Work Act has now changed to one that is done either knowingly or recklessly. Now, this person can be and can include a company director, a human resource manager or other manager, a payroll officer or an accountant. The accessorial liability provisions allow anyone involved in the contravention to be accountable, even if the business has gone into liquidation. So, what does it mean for someone to be involved in the contravention? So, according to Section 550 of the Fair Work Act, the person is deemed to be involved in the contravention if they aided, abetted, counseled, or procured the breach induce the breach through threats, promises, or other means, were in any way by act or omission knowingly concerned in or imparted to the breach, or conspired with others to bring about the breach. The most commonly cited grounds for this liability are aiding and abetting and being not concerned in the breach. To aid and abet, the individual must have intentionally participated in the contravention although they did not need to know that their actions were unlawful, it's sufficient that they had knowledge of the facts and circumstances constituting the breach. And in some cases, actual knowledge may be inferred from a combination of suspicious circumstances and a failure to investigate further. Given the increasing risk faced by directors, what practical steps can they take to protect themselves and their businesses? Here are some key strategies. Number one, 
directors should undertake regular training to stay informed about it. Issues of the latest developments in state and law and employee entitlements. This might include attending seminars as you are doing so at a time, participating in online courses or engaging with industry associations. Directors should ensure that their companies conduct regular risk assessments to identify potential safety hazards and areas of non compliance with employee entitlements. These assessments should be thorough and cover all aspects of the business's operations. So I encourage you to think about your own businesses and when was the last time a comprehensive risk assessment was conducted? What were the key findings? How were they addressed? Regular risk assessments are a crucial tool for identifying and managing risks before they become issues. Directors should also ensure that their companies have robust systems in place to manage compliance with workplace safety and employee entitlements. And this might include implementing safety management software, conducting regular audits and payroll systems, and ensuring that there are clear policies and procedures in place in this regard. Directors should not hesitate to seek legal and professional advice if they're unsure about any aspect of their duties. Engaging with experienced advisors can help directors navigate com complex legal requirements and avoid potential dangers. Finally, directors should work to foster a culture of compliance within their organisations. And this means leading by example, demonstrating a commitment to safety and fair treatment of employees and encouraging open communication in respect of compliance issues. So in conclusion, um, the evolving legal landscape places significant responsibilities on directors and those advising them and the risks are real the penalties for non-compliance are severe. Directors must take an active role in ensuring their businesses comply with workplace safety and employment the top obligations. This involves not only legal requirements, but also implementing systems to manage risk. I shall now hand to over to Helene, one of the terms of solvency specialists who navigate you through key considerations for directors within the context of insolvency and disputes arising within this field. Thank you, John. A very comprehensive and somewhat terrifying presentation. <laughs> um, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for taking the time uh, to come here today. My name is Helene Crusitas. Uh, I'm one of the directors from the Dispute Resolution and Insolvency team here. Um, I've been heavily involved in business from a very young age. I understand how hard it is to run a business. I understand the constant obstacles that business owners face on a day-to-day -day basis, especially in today's economic climate um, and especially in light of the increased obligations and responsibilities that are constantly being placed on business owners. So that's very why that's the reason why it's very much my passion to help directors and companies try to navigate through this complex area of the law. Now, as Jonathan so eloquently summarised, the illegal landscape for directors has and continues to evolve, resulting in significant changes for directors and increasing the instances in which the corporate veil is being pierced. Now, the concept of the corporate veil uh, refers to the legal distinction between the company the, and then the shareholders, directors and officers. The principle is there to establish a, that the company is a separate legal entity away from its owners and therefore operate as a corporate shield to protect directors' personal assets from business-related risks and liabilities. However, that corporate veil can be pierced, holding directors personally liable with their set risk. Now, in the context of litigation, we often encounter directors um, in a position where they didn't know what their responsibilities and uh, obligations were, uh, especially in the context of insolvency. And that brings me to the purpose of my presentation today. The aim of this presentation is very much to try to provide you with a brief overview of directors' duties and highlight some of the key considerations in the context of insolvency. I've cherry-picked some examples of when the corporate veil is pierced um, in the context of insolvency and what claims you may be exposed to. So, very briefly, what directors, what duties do directors actually have? Um, that's actually a very important question. 
and to be honest, I think it's a question that a lot of directors out there don't know the answer to. First, there's obviously a director a duty to company shareholders. Um, there's a requirement like Jonathan has highlighted to comply with general and specific laws applying to the company's operations, which are your work health and safety laws and employment laws. Secondly, a director has a duty to keep up to date financial records. And third, there's a duty to, of course, comply with the tax obligations. And last, there are the general duties that are contained in the Corporations Act, which include the duty to exercise your duties with good uh, apologies, powers and duties with care and diligence than a reasonable person would, to exercise powers and duties in good faith and in the company's best interest and, of course, for a proper purpose, and not to improperly use a director's position to gain advantage for herself or someone else or to cause detriment to the company, and not to improperly use information obtained through a director's position for an advantage for herself or someone else or to cause detriment to the company. Now, in the context of insolvency, a director's duties very much does expand. But before we talk about those duties, I do want to um, touch upon when an insolvency situation might actually arise. And I don't intend to delve too much into this issue because, quite frankly, it's incredibly subjective. Um, and when you're running the day-to-day -day operations of the business, it's sometimes simply not that black and white. So, simply, the court will say the test is it's when a company cannot pay its debts when they become due and payable. Determining when a company is insolvent therefore predominantly involves what we refer to as the cash flow test. Now that requires a realistic assessment of whether the company's anticipated current and future cash flows will be sufficient to pay the current and future liabilities as of when they become due and payable. So I say cash is king. Um, now, I think it would be very naive for me to stand up here today and say the cash flow is everything. When in reality, we know that it's probably one of the hardest aspects of operating business. Now, this is why we often draw upon the balance sheet test, and that looks at a calendar situation. So we look at things like whether additional money can realistically be raised in a timely manner, and whether there are surplus assets that can actually be sold off in a relatively short period of time without affecting the operations of the business. And the law also recognises that there is no clear dividing line when it comes to solvency or insolvency from the perspective of directors who are trading in the company. And I think the complexity of this area is summarised, um, and this is my favourite quote, um, it's an uh, observation by Justice Needham um, from the New South Wales Supreme Court in which he said, it is easy enough to tell the difference in hindsight when the company has either weathered the storm or drowned with all hands. Sometimes it is not so easy when the company is still contending with the waves. Lack of liquidity is not conclusive of insolvency. Neither is availability of assets conclusive of solvency. Now, if a company is insolvent, or there is a real risk of insolvency, the director's duties expand to include creditors, and that obviously includes employees with outstanding entitlements. So first, the director has the duty to prevent a company from entering into a creditor defeating disposition. So that's a transaction where property is uh, sold for less than market value. Second, a director has a duty to keep up to date books and records. Now, this is one of the first thing a liquidator will look at. Uh, a creditor, asset or liquidator can actually take action against a company uh, for trading whilst insolvent if that company didn't have up-to-date adequate financial records for a certain period of time, and they'll therefore generally be presumed solvent. So it's essentially a free kick for ASIC or for the liquidator. Third, a company has a positive duty to prevent, the director has a positive duty to prevent a company from trading whilst insolvent. So that means that the director who is knowingly trading whilst insolvent can be heard personally liable for the debts that were incurred by the company. And this is, again, an instance when the corporate bail will be pierced. Now, insolvent trading is quite serious. It is a criminal offence. You can be punished up to $200,000, $200, five years in prison. And then there is also the reputational damage in which, as a director, you can be disqualified um, for acting as a director for up to five years, which obviously holds huge um, reputational damage. 
Now, I have cherry picked a director's duty to prevent a company from trading whilst insolvent. Uh, now, this is a claim that is probably one of the most common allegations that are made against directors. Now, this duty contains uh, some distinct elements. The first one is that you were a director at the time the company incurred those debts. The company was, of course, insolvent at the time those debts were incurred. Mm -hmm. And of course, the last one being that there were reasonable bounds for suspecting that the company was insolvent or become insolvent. As a director, if you do breach that duty, again, the corporate veil is pierced. And as a liquidator, they may be able to pursue you, pursue you personally to recover those debts. I don't have time today to delve too much into the, each, each of those elements of um, a, a claim of uh, trading whilst insolvent. But what I will flag um, is that the court looks at a reasonable grounds for suspecting insolvency to be a suspicion that something exists that is more than a mere idol wondering whether it whether or not it exists is a positive feeling of actual apprehension without sufficient evidence now i think a really good example to look at is a company um, that perhaps uh, seasonal in the business, so a, a company that's located down at the beach, for example. Um, so such a business will likely experience decreased cash flow during winter as well, so it's down at the beach, but it increased cash flow during summer when everybody floods down there. So therefore, it is very much plausible for a director to expect that the company um, was not insolvent uh, because of those flows in seasons. So although there might be a shortage during the winter season, they would expect the company to pick up again in summer. So you cannot be in a position to be concerned with the liquidity of the company because you're always conscious any of the problems that may be encountered will be overcome in the summer period. Now there are statutory defences to a claim uh, for breach of uh, a duty to trade whilst insolvent. Now, there are four defences. There's the reasonable grounds defence. That is, of course, that the director believed, had reasonable grounds to believe that the company wasn't insolvent. Now, that expectation has a high degree of satisfaction and of certainty, it can't just be a mere hope or suspicion. The second defence is the illness or absent management defence. Because of illness or other good reason, the director did not actually take part in the management of the business. And then the third defence is the reasonable steps. To... <coughs> now, that's the defence that states that the director took all reasonable steps to prevent a company from incurring the debt. So, for example, that is a director appointing an administrator. The fourth defence is a competent and reliable person defence. Um, now, that is that the director had reasonable grounds to believe and did believe that a competent person and reliable person who was responsible for providing adequate information about the company insolvency was fulfilling that responsibility and the director expected that based on that information the company was there. So now again I've cherry-picked uh, just one of the defences here today and that is the competent reliable person defence. The reason for that is I think that the ordinary person out there would say oh well, I've got my accountant and my accountant said we're all okay. Um, however, it's just not that simple. Uh, to understand the type of situations that this defence is intended to cover, I'm just going to have a quick look at a New South Wales Supreme Court case of Manpac Industries. Now, this is an unreported case in which uh, the former directors of industrial concrete manufacturing um, were pursued, uh, in which they the company was wound up, so it was in 1994, so some, some time ago now, uh, they sold manufactured, they manufactured and sold precast concrete panels. Now, in March 1994, the Federal Commissioner of Taxation was pressing to wind up the company uh, for non payment of group taxes. Now, the director said that he was concerned about the financial future of ICN and he actually agreed and did retain Turner Capital Services company which Mr Turner was the principal consultant at uh, and they were engaged to assess ICM's financial and trading position and to negotiate any capital raising. Now Mr Turner did present a report to the directors and in the report he stated that ICM was full. 
So as a result, the director said he believed that both companies were solvent and there, even though that were clearly lacking liquidity. Now, whilst Mr. Turner appeared to have a pretty good grasp on what was happening in the books and records and what was happening with the bank, he was not given full and proper details about the trade creditors and debtors. So the court held that it was extremely difficult for a director to say that a person is responsible person who was responsible for providing adequate information about solvency was actually fulfilling that responsibility when the director wasn't providing complete information. Importantly, the court held that the purpose of the defence is to cover the situation where there is a large corporation with bulky accounts and where there is a system in place, competent accountants, credit controllers and financial management and the board has a regime whereby those people report to them any problems that the board might therefore pick up. It is not the purpose of this defence to do with situations where a small company with directors who have little accountancy in five years bring a troubleshooter in, supply that troubleshooter with information that may or may not be complete, receive report back, reports back, and then try to rely upon those reports. And another point of distinction that was raised in this case was that Mr. Turner wasn't actually engaged to provide advice on the solvency of ICM. So therefore, the court held that the defence was not paid out. And the other defence I'm going to very, very, very briefly touch upon is the reasonable steps defence. So this one here um, brings me to the safe harbour regime which is a raising, regime that may be available to directors uh, and act as a defence to insolvent trading claims. Now, in essence, the safe harbour regime allows directors to implement a restructure without the risk of being exposed to insolvent trading claims if the restructure ultimately fails. Now, to seek protection uh, of the safe harbour regime, a director needs to be able to prove that their actions were reasonably likely to result in a better outcome for the company and its creditors than if the company was to be placed into administration or liquidation. Now, the Corporation Act does include a number of appropriate safe harbour steps that need to be taken. So, for example, you need to make sure that there's no employee in for some misconduct, ensuring that the company keeps appropriate financial records, you must hire a qualified advisor, you must stay fully informed about the financial position of the company, and of course, you must develop a restructuring plan. Now, safe harbour credit regime doesn't necessarily protect you from all debts, but it certainly protects you from debts that are incurred while attempting to revive or save your business. So these include debts that are incurred directly or indirectly in relation to the actions taken. Now, the one other one other provision I just want to briefly touch upon as well is the exoneration provision. Now, if the court does ultimately find a director liable um, for trading whilst insolvent, there is a section in the Corporations Act that is an exoneration provision, which enables the court to relieve you wholly or partly from your liability in very certain circumstances. It is a discretionary power so to the court in all the circumstances to make this decision. Now, the purpose of the prison provision is to excuse company officers from liability in situations where it would be unjust and oppressive not to do so, recognising that such officers and business people who act in the environment are involved in risks in commercial decision making. Now, it's very much a relevant consideration to this provision, whether or not you sought advice from an administrator at the relevant time and what the outcome of that advice was. Uh, in a case, it's a Supreme Court case of South Australia, uh, Scott and Williams, the court considered very, um, it was an identical provision uh, in relation to the exoneration of a director. Um, now, this director was partially exonerated for the debts that were incurred because he took positive steps to approach, but initially opted not to appoint an administrator to the company. Uh, the director did not appoint an administrator because he wished to see the company ultimately succeed and believed that there was some possibility that the company would succeed if it was allowed to trade, even though it had chronic cash flow, cash flow shortage. Now, despite it, and very much predictable, as very much you would assume, um, the high proportion of these exoneration applications are unsuccessful. They are discretionary. Um, however, this case does demonstrate that they are sometimes paid out. 
Now, moving away from directors' duties, uh, it's also important for directors to understand under the Corporations Act, there are certain provisions that enable a liquidator to pull back transactions. Now, these are transactions that are commercial transactions. So they're insolvent transactions which being entered into um, during a two-year period before the company's wound up. There's unfair preferences, unfair loans, and unreasonable director related transactions. In our experience, um, steps are usually taken by directors um, or companies that are experiencing financial distress um, to work with their accountants um, when it comes to loan accounts or related entity transactions. Uh, and quite frankly, those steps are often taken without understanding these avoidable transactions that can result in the director being in a worse off position. Now, for the purpose of this presentation, I'm actually just going to focus on unreasonable director related transactions. Uh, and the reason why I'm going to focus on this one is that a liquidator doesn't actually need to prove that a company uh, was insolvent at the time. So, simply, uh, an unreasonable director related transaction involved payments that were continuing for four years, ending on the relation to the day, for example, the day that the company was wound up, uh, made by a company to a director or a close associate to the director. Um, and it's a transaction that a reasonable person in the company circumstances would not have entered into, having regard to the benefit, if any, company, the detriment to the company, the respective benefits to other parties to the transaction, and any other relevant matters. Now, a simple example that I'm going to look at is uh, Crowell Maxwell and Chips. Now, this is a case in which the liquidated issue with the payment payments, um, credit card payments that the directors made um, for were performed in the business. Uh, now, the matter actually went all the way up to the New South Wales Supreme Court. Now, in this case, the directors operated a childcare from their premises. The liquidators sought to claim a number of transactions back from the directors for expenses that they put on the company's credit card. So it was for food, alcohol, things like that. And the directors admitted, yep, those transactions were uh, personal. However, whilst they were working in the business, the directors didn't draw a wage. So rather the directors drew on the company's funds to pay for certain personal expenses. The liquidators advanced the claim that because there was no contractual relationship between the company's directors uh, and their entitlement to a wage, they couldn't draw upon those funds. And the court held that's not true. Ultimately, um, there was an expense of approximately $15,000 per annum that the directors were drawing. So around here, you're looking at $76,000 that the liquidators were looking to cost. And the court said it was a very reasonable, reasonable amount for the services and the amount that was, and an amount that was favourable to the company. The court was of the view that it wasn't to the point that the liquidators were submitting that they hadn't, that there was no form of agreement between the company and the directors that the directors could draw upon the funds of the company in lieu or wait. Court of Appeal held that there was evidence that the directors worked in the business and worked very long hours in the business to keep the business going. The business continued to operate because the directors were so heavily involved and because of the services they provided. So the court relied upon common knowledge that a payment of $15,000 per annum was extremely reasonable Liquidators didn't leave any evidence to the contrary. So, court held in all circumstances, it could not be said that the directors received a gift or a bargain of such magnitude. The payments were unreasonable. Now, the reason why I drew that example to you is I think it's quite common for directors um, to draw upon the company's funds like that. Um, however, it also draws upon how these type of transactions can be heavily scrutinised. And there are simple mechanisms that directors can put in place in order to avoid these type of situations, like, for example, contract. Now, the other case I was going to look at is a WA case, um, the Court of Appeal. Now, this case, uh, the Court of Appeal considered whether the purchase of a plot for a director's wife was an unreasonable director-related transaction. Now, quickly, the background facts in this case are um, Mr. Harburn was the sole director of Harburn Group Australia. Harburn Group provided financial services. In 2007, uh, Mr. Harburn decided to reduce his workload and he sold his client base. 
The sale agreement was entered around June 2007, and in July 2007, the company was paid $765,000. And in the same month, Mr. Harbin bought a $385,000 boat for his wife using Harbin Group's funds. Then Harbin Group was subsequently wound up in April 2011. The liquidators of Harbin Group sought recovery of the funds used to buy the boat. In the first instance, uh, despite no benefit to Harbour Group in purchasing the boat, and obviously the detriment to the company that it lost 385000 it was highly relevant that the company was not only solvent, but it was comfortably solvent at the time. It had net assets of between 445000 and 535000 And at the time of the transaction, the future of Harbour Group was uncertain. It may continue to trade indefinitely, and Mr. Halpin was in complete control of the company at that time. So for those reasons, the liquidators ultimately failed. However, the liquidators appealed that decision. And at the heart of that appeal was the relevance or weight uh, to be given to the financial health of the company at the time of the boat transaction. The court rejected the original decision, and in particular, the master's finding that the director reasonably believed that the company was in a comfortable financial position to the time of the transaction. For example, much of the company's income in that relevant year was the once-off capital gain from the sale of the financial planning client base. Future income would be significantly reduced because, of course, of the sale of the client base. And the company had a significant contingent CGT liability arising from the business sale, which had not yet been quantified. So accordingly, at the best, the company's financial health was uncertain at the time of the transaction, and the director knew this. Also, the court considered that the boat transaction was unreasonable regardless of the financial health of the company. So in essence, a transaction may be so objectively unreasonable that the financial position of the company at the time of entering the transaction is simply not relevant. Now, there are two main defences to avoidable transaction claim. The first one is that you weren't a party to the transaction. And the second one is that uh, a person who was a party to such a transaction acted in a way and had no reasonable grounds to suspect that the company was insolvent. However, those two defences do not apply to an unreasonable direct related transaction. So, as a director, what should you do? As directors, it is important to be equipped with the knowledge and information so that you understand your general duties in running a company and in particular your duty in the context of insolvency. The presentation today highlights how the corporate bail is increasingly being pierced, resulting in directors becoming increasingly personally liable for debts of the company. So ultimately, what should you do? First, it is important to set yourself up and protect your assets. This has never been so important. I do not profess to be a tax or asset protection expert, um, but I do encourage you to speak to somebody who is. Uh, we have uh, Daniel Ardema, who is sitting here tonight, or today, sorry, and I urge you to speak to him uh, about your company structure uh, and any asset protection strategies that can be implemented. Secondly, if you have a positive feeling or actual apprehension regarding the company's financial status, it is important to act and obtain appropriate advice from an insolvency practitioner. I would always recommend bringing your lawyer along though, because such meetings, we can provide guidance on some of the topics and the transactions that we covered today. And importantly, it means that your discussions remain confidential. So key takeaways. Please always ensure that you're aware of your general duties as a director of a company. In an insolvency context, those duties are expanded to include creditors, including your employees. Time is of the essence when dealing with a company in financial distress. A director should always obtain advice promptly from a professional if they are concerned about the company's insolvency. And keep in mind the potential issues that directors may face if their company is placed into liquidation. And that is the presentation for today. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to raise your hand or approach Jonathan or myself or Daniel, who's here today.